welcome everyone to the ninth debate of Michaelmas term and my final few moments in the chair as your president. The motion before the House tonight is this House believes Western intervention is a force for good, has been a force for good. We'll be opening in the beginning with the first speaker, but the President's debate is a bit of a ceremonial event, and I want to thank everyone who's worked hard this term to make the event so special, to put on a series of panels, speaker events and debates, and hand over to your wonderful Lent team, who are going to do such a great job next time. So to open, I'd like to thank our social events officer, Edward Hilditch, who will be handing over to Harrison Moore for the Lent term. I then want to thank our brilliant Equalities Officer, Ellie Breeze, for her service this term and welcome Shibangi Ghost to take up the mantle for Lent. <laughs> thank you, Eleanor Shimeli. We'll be handing over to Salvador Widdicombe. And for our debates, Sam Carling will be handing over to Max Ghosh. <laughs> and finally, it's time for me to retire as your president for Michaelmas term. I couldn't be more grateful to leave you in the endlessly competent hands of one of the most impressive people I've ever met and also a dear friend of mine, Christopher George. The union is here for people to challenge ideas and be challenged by them. My role in this chair is to facilitate this. As such, I expect that everyone here is respectful of the procedures and practices in place to ensure a proper debate. The main speakers have around 10 minutes each to put forward their case. You are encouraged to raise points of information against them, but it's up to the speaker to take it. If they do not take it, then I ask you to let them continue in their speech. Floor speeches should be kept to around two minutes, and that way we can get through more people. So, without much further ado, let us turn to the debate at hand. Our first speaker is Lara Brown. Lara is the outgoing president of the Cambridge Union. In her spare time, she's also a third year English literature student at Downing College. She's looking forward to retirement and spending some time with the much neglected romantic poets of her dissertation. Lara, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm looking forward to watching your debates from afar. I'm not sure how familiar you all are with the slightly antiquated traditions of this society, but for those not aware, the presidential debate motion is set by the outgoing president, in this case myself, and it's meant to represent a clause very close to their heart. In this speech, as my final act as your president, I'm given 10 minutes to convince you of something I care deeply about. So <laughs> I know what you're now all thinking with that context, and that's, what on earth is this girl doing? <laughs> this is not a debate she can win. West intervention's been very resoundingly condemned in Cambridge. It comes up in this house every week as a counterpoint for a government we're arguing in favour of. I recall when our term card came out, there was a satirical review that asked us to look forward to Lara Brown trying to defend the Iraq war, a uh, cause seemingly so impossible it rendered comedy, so thanks to the tit hauler for that. <laughs> the difficulty is, <laughs> the causes closest to my heart are things that I've wrestled with. They're issues that at some point I've been deeply torn on, and that's why I want us to debate Western intervention here tonight. I think it's in the deep spirit of the Cambridge Union. This is a society that has formed a crucial and integral part of my time at Cambridge. I've come to this chamber almost every Thursday for my entire degree, and I've wrestled here with very difficult concepts. I'm proud that this term we've run a series of debates that have tackled issues and changed minds. 
There's been a sizable swing against every motion or for every motion this week, and I have not left a single debate without having at least one of my prior views challenged. So I hope for one last time in Michaelmas we can grapple with a difficult concept and come to a difficult answer. And that's why I'm here before you tonight to argue that Western intervention has in fact been a force for good. I'm not here to defend every act of Western intervention, but I do sincerely believe that the defence of liberal democracy must be an integral part of Western foreign policy. And I do believe that when the West has intervened, it has overwhelmingly been a force for good. The motion at hand is a tricky one for me, which is entirely my fault because I set it. <laughs> but it's asking us to consider things that are fundamentally unknowable. To say that Western intervention has been a force for good is to say the world in general is a better place for it. Now, it's impossible for me in these 10 minutes to set up a perfect counterfactual to depict for you the parallel universe of what the world would look like had the West not intervened at pivotal moments in recent history. And I think that's the fact that's unfortunately biased so many of us against West intervention. It's very easier for the media or politicians or even side opposition to get up and throw at me 10, 15 examples of the negative externalities of Western intervention. That's very simple. And I won't shy away from them. I'm going to engage with them. But I also want to talk about inaction tonight. Inaction is a positive choice, is a decision to do something, a decision which has hurt people in the past. So, in the spirit of rising to the mantle of difficult questions, I'm going to engage in one of the most tenuous and difficult arguments about West intervention, and that's dealing with Afghanistan. Afghanistan has come up almost every week in a floor speech. We debated New Labour last week, and I heard a lot of it there. So I want to give it some proper time tonight. On the 15th of August last year, after President Biden's administration resolved to withdraw American troops from Afghanistan, Kabul fell to the Taliban. Life for ordinary Afghans, and for women in particular, has become drastically worse since then. Just a few weeks ago, their Ministry for the Propagation of Virtue and the Prevention of Vice announced a ban on women entering parks, even when accompanied by a male chaperone. A further dehumanizing act, intentionally, deliberately intended to exclude them from public life. For as long as I can remember, Afghanistan, like Vietnam before it, has been deployed as a byword for the failure and hubris of Western foreign policy. In fact, a lot of people have stood up and given the exact case study I mentioned as an example of why Western intervention has failed. But I think that the fall of Kabul last year, far from vindicating isolationism, proves beyond all doubt the urgent need for Western intervention. However difficult it might have been to maintain British and American troops in Afghanistan, the country is tangibly worse off for their absence. We should, in other words, have intervened more and intervened harder. The West failed to assert itself significantly in Afghanistan, and that failure has resulted in the incalculable harm for millions of people. On that point, yes. was it the West's place to intervene in Afghanistan? I'm not a moral relativist. I believe there's a correct way of life to live, and I believe that oppressing women, banning them from going outside, not educating them, is not the right way of living life, and it's not something I'm prepared to stand by and accept. I think this does come down to moral relativism versus some sort of um, belief in genuine ways of life that are correct. Um, I struggle to stand by and watch women oppressed so brutally, watch men murdered in front of their children, et cetera, et cetera. We actually debated Afghanistan last year, and I was actually very surprised the motion put before the House was this House would have remained in Afghanistan, and this chamber voted overwhelmingly in favour, and a recognition that intervention can do well when carefully managed, and intervention is necessary to protect the women and children in oppressive regimes. When we chose to leave Afghanistan, we forgot who we were fighting for. Before we left, Afghanistan was more prosperous and more stable than it had been 20 years ago. Withdrawal from Afghanistan was a mistake, a mistake led by a harmful doctrine of isolationism and a mistake we must never forget when setting future foreign policy. As I said earlier, this motion is difficult for me to prove. Third opposition need to find evidence of fair West intervention. I need to prove inaction has been harmful and show you how the West might look had the world not intervened. So, in an attempt to do that, I'll turn now to a position many in this room probably share, and that's the terrible failure of the West to intervene in Rwanda. 
I truly believe the West has a moral duty to prevent atrocities from occurring, a moral duty that flows directly from our disproportionate power and wealth. It is one of the greatest tragedies of the last century that this moral duty wasn't applied with respect to Rwanda. But I forget to I'll come back to you. Between the 7th of April and the 15th of July 1994, during the Rwandan Civil War, an estimated 500,000 members of the Tutsi minority ethnic group were killed. These deaths, due to our failure to intervene, must always rest on the shoulders of the West. So I hope now, taking this speech at its best, that I have demonstrated that inaction is a positive choice, it's a harmful choice, and it's a choice that has led to the deaths of millions of people over the course of history. I've dealt with archetypal bad intervention, and I'm sure you'll hear many more throughout the next hour. What I'm not sure you hear about are the countless, hundreds of examples of unambiguously good intervention that have taken place over the last century. This list could go on forever. I'm sure David wouldn't be thrilled if I spoke for a few hours on this, so I've got a list of, of three key ones I think are quite important. NATO intervention in Kosovo. By 1998, 300,000 Kosovars had fled their homes. Every attempt at a ceasefire agreement had been ignored. Every diplomatic routine had been tried. And yet, after a 78-day interventionist campaign by NATO, the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia accepted the principles for a political solution. They accepted an immediate end to violence and a rapid withdrawal of their military, police and paramilitary forces. This crucial act of Western intervention helped relieve Kosovo Albanians from the ethnic cleansing that was carried out by the Serbs. One information. Yes. Um, so you claim that the American troops in Kosovo have been ambiguously good, but the intervention of Americans in Kosovo has not been ratified by the Security Council. Could you explain why that is, if it's unambiguously good? Intervention in Kosovo has been very controversial because it wasn't ratified by the Security Council. I think waiting for the ratification would have been far too long. It allowed a number of deaths that weren't possible. And I think the fact that a genuine ethnic cleansing was paused justifies that action. Um, I am aware of the controversy. Moving to a second example of intervention, Operation Pallister. In May 2000, the British intervened in the Sierra Leone Civil War, rescuing the capital Freetown from the Revolutionary United Front. This was an evil rebel group, and this is an example where I really believe moral relativism has no place on the world stage. They were a group that abducted thousands of boys and girls, forcing them to serve as child soldiers and sometimes prostitutes. Harrowing accounts of the war have reported that for entertainment, some soldiers would bet on the sex of an unborn baby and slice open a woman's womb to determine the winner. The leaders of this group were convicted of war crimes and crimes against humanity in 2009. And yet, after just 18 months of intervention, the country was stabilised. A free and fair constitutional process was established, and the lives of 8 million people were improved. My final example, Operation Ocean Shield. A recent international response to a major hijacking for ransom industry developing in the chaos of the long civil war in Somalia. Piracy in the area had cost the global shipping industry around £7 billion a year. Many sailors lost their lives. Over a 1,000 were held hostage for weeks, months, years, some never coming home to their families. In 2010, NATO recorded 45 actual hijackings, 132 attempted, and 147 harmful disruptions. By close of operations, this total had dropped to zero. When NATO closed the operation, we are now seeing it climb again. A need for sort of constant and careful Western intervention in these places surely is obvious at this point. I could fill hours with examples like this. I'm going to have to get through my speech, but thank you. I could fill hours of examples of successful West interventions that have restored peace and democracy to countries in crisis, but I think David would get very angry with me. So I'll ask you instead to consider French intervention in the first and second Ivorian civil wars, Australian intervention in the East Timor and the Solomon Islands, and American involvement in defeating brutal war criminals in Uganda. But... I want to end my speech on the starkest example of the necessity of Western intervention in the modern day, and that is, of course, in Ukraine. Without Western intervention, Kiev would have undoubtedly been crushed. Zelensky likely deposed. Had our government and other NATO members not committed substantial equipment and military spending to their struggle against an unprovoked invasion, I dread to think what might have happened to Ukrainians. 
If you don't believe in an altruistic reason for intervention, if you genuinely don't believe that liberating the oppressed is important, let me try and convince you of pragmatic reasons for intervention. When we do what is necessary to preserve Ukraine's independence from Russia, we send a clear message to our enemies. We prove ourselves to be united and cohesive and strong. And by doing so, we make ourselves a good deal safer. Appeasement. And I'm afraid I really do think appeasement is the only meaningful alternative Western intervention. It hasn't exactly worked well for us in the past. And a skepticism about intervention, when taken to its extreme, and you'll forgive me for the low-hanging fruit, often has the paradoxical effect of making destructive wars, like the Second World War, far more likely. When we stand by, when we do nothing, when women are killed in their homes, when children are forced into slavery, we embolden our enemies to the point at which they become existential threats. And so I urge you to accept that by pursuing our foreign policy objectives through different types of intervention, ranging from boots on the ground to international aid, we can secure our country's future and survival. And so, when you walk out of those doors tonight, please vote to grapple with a very difficult question. Vote for a country that stands up to its oppressors, which takes responsibility for its enormous privilege, and walk through the eye door in recognition of the weight of that responsibility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lara, for our opening speech of the evening. Um, I should have mentioned that we are delighted to welcome some selected students, as you may have noticed, from one of our partner schools, so they are in the house tonight. We're now going to turn to our second speaker, our first speaker for the opposition, Yasmin Ahmed. Yasmin Ahmed is, oh, wait for it, is a lawyer and activist and the UK Director of Human Rights Watch. She's also served as the Executive Director of award-winning human rights organisation, Rights and Security International. Yasmin, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me here this evening. Thank you to the proposition, the first proposition speaker. I thought that was a wonderful start to the debate. So firstly, I want to make four contextual points which inform my position that Western intervention has not been a force for good. Firstly, my life has been fundamentally shaped by Western intervention. That is colonial intervention. The British and other colonial powers went on a quest to civilise the world and in this context, they ruled over my father's family in British India for just under a century. Suffice to say that the ongoing trauma of violence inflicted against my family and other Indians during colonial rule and the devastating effect of the negligent withdrawal that left up to a million people dead and millions destitute is a trauma that is seared into my psyche and that of my family as well as mi millions of Indians and Pakistanis today. Secondly, it is my job day in, day out, as the UK Director of Human Rights Watch, to try and convince governments, mostly the UK government given my role, to use foreign policy tools to push other governments to stop committing human rights harms and violations. Whether it's financial sanctions on governments linked to commercial entities in Myanmar, travel bans on Chinese officials, or the suspension of military assistance to Egypt, I believe it is essential that states don't sit by and watch human rights abuses and crimes being committed. So let's just be clear on that. However, I think this is a really important point in this debate because nothing in life I have found is black and white. There is always a cost and a consequence of any action that is taken, including at times, as we have seen, loss of life and severe human rights violations. This is certainly almost always true for interventions that involve military force. Whether the thousands of innocent civilians, including children, who died during the ISAF bombing in Afghanistan, 
And I pause here to remember a very startling fact that between 2016 and 2020, 40% of all civilian casualties in Afghanistan were children. Or those that were subject to torture and mistreatment by the UK or US forces in Iraq. But even for non-violent military measures, there are consequences that need to be considered. This was laid bare when Madeleine Albright, then US ambassador to the UN, publicly stated that the death of a reported half a million of Iraqi children who died as a result of the consequence of US sanctions on Iraq following the 1991 Gulf War was a price worth paying. It is important to remember not only that consequence, that those sanctions also had longer term effects. They reinforced Saddam Hussein's power and weakened Iraqi society, which contributed to the collapse of Iraqi society after the Western invasion and Saddam's fall. Thirdly, of my contextual points, I am not arguing that all Western interventions have been destabilising and harmful, and nor do I need to. The contention is that Western intervention on the whole has been a force for good. And the evidence, I would say, is clear that it has not. Finally, when I speak about Western interventions, I will speak to military interventions. But as I note above, there is certainly, and previously, there is certainly strong evidence to suggest that even non-military interventions, including the use of blunt sanctions, like we saw in Iraq and Iran, have not, on the whole, stabilised and lifted societies. And again, I say, on the whole. Nearly everywhere in that the West and Western powers have intervened militarily in the past 20 years, many times under the guise of counterterrorism is worse off today than it was when the intervention began. From Iraq to Libya and Afghanistan to Somalia, societies are fractured, fractured, governance has been nearly wholly undermined, corruption is rife, violence is epidemic, with millions already dead and injured, women's rights have been annihilated, extrajudicial executions are often rife. And we see this case in Afghanistan, for example. As my, the previous speaker has mentioned, the situation of women's rights, we know that there's extrajudicial ex executions that my organisation have been routinely researching and reporting on. And we also know that nearly 19 million people in Afghanistan are experiencing high levels of food insecurity with more than 300 with more than 34,000 children admitted to hospital with severe malnutrition not 20 years ago not 40 years ago in 2022 it is likely that many other afghan children did not reach it to, did not reach hospital Turning to Iraq, on a conservative estimate, hundreds of thousands of Iraqis have died as a result of the Iraq invasion, with millions more displaced. While it is true that one can say not all these outcomes are because of Western military intervention, and I agree with that, the interventions can, there cannot be an argument that the interventions have played a part in this. And what we can certainly say is that on the whole, Western interventions have not created better outcomes for those living in these countries and regions, but instead in many, and I would say most situations, have left them in tatters. Now, I want, and I think it's important, that we understand why this is the case. And I want to speak to three reasons. So firstly, I think the first reason and an important reason is that societies that are not our own, that are of another culture and another people, every society is complex. And it has proved time and time again that Western countries have failed to understand the very basic political and cultural dynamics of the country that they intervene in. 
This has had devastating consequences in Iraq, for example, where the West had little understanding of the sectarian politics in Iraq, which with de had le has led to unprecedented violence and instability in Iraq and Syria. Secondly, and this to me is probably of my life lessons that I've learned in my career and my life more generally, is the key point. The approach of Western intervention has been one that has been seen primarily through the lens of violence. It is securitized and very short term, and that fails to adequately grapple with and prioritize the underlying reasons and drivers of instability, or the vacuums that have led to people like Gaddafi and Saddam having power. And the factors, most importantly, that will lead to long-term stability, security, and prosperity. And what do I mean? Strong governance institutions, a vibrant and active civil society, access to education and healthcare, gender equality, and tackling corruption. In fact, many of these interventions have served to perpetuate corruption, exclusion and abuse, and unequal access to services, opportunities, and resources. And I will say that Afghanistan is a very good example of this. While it is certainly the case that 20 years of interventions did see progress in many areas, including governance, girls' education and participation in public life, as well as media freedom and a number of other things. However, Western states' propensity to prioritise short-term military gains over the creation of genuinely democratic institutions and the protection of human rights fatally undermined both ISAF's mission and the entire post-2001 state-building effort. As my colleague, the Human Rights Watch Afghan researcher, Patty Grossman, told me, over-reliance of airstrikes without adequate civilian protections, relying on abusive warlords to fill security uh, uh, vacuums, political and political leadership roles, and largely ignoring wholesale corruption, uh, and fostered, has fostered deep, did foster and continues to foster deep resentment and distrust on the US and Afghan governments, previously, grievously weakening Afghanistan's military and political capabilities, and made it far easier for the Taliban to gain ground. Libya, is another stark example of how Western countries fail to understand that military force without a plan for and an investment in the long-term stability of the country is nothing but disaster. We have seen in Libya the security vacuum that is left after the US-led intervention has been filled by legions of armed militia, foreign mercenary, Islamic extremists, human traffickers, regional and international powers, which has left the country in a state of instability and mayhem. And within that context, my organisation at Human Rights Watch and many others have documented long-term arbitrary detention, unlawful killings and enforced disappearances. I will ignore... I'm receptive to a lot of the things you're, you're saying, but it seems to be that you're making the case that our interventions should be for the long term. Um, they should be better thought out, but you're not making a case against interve intervention in itself. So um, to put that in a concrete question to you, do, do you think that Afghanistan is better off now that we've left? So I think the point is, is that we are, we are looking at whether Western military intervention has done well and has been a force for good. And what we can see, and the only evidence I have of that, is where Afghanistan is now and where Afghanistan was before, in two, before 2001. There were not thousands of children dying. There were not thousands of children starving. I do not say this is a perfect world. I do not say that this is black and white. I have myself personally grappled with this issue immensely over time. I worked as a legal advisor at the UK Foreign Office during Syria, during Libya and other things. And I can tell you it's something that's kept me up at night 
But what I have seen is Western military intervention has been through, seen through one prism. And I think it's important to note those people that are, are, are the pro biggest proponents of Western military intervention, when you ask them, because they talk about values and they talk about stability and they talk about protecting people, women, children. But what do they do when those women and children arrive on our shores as refugees? They tell them that they should leave. They send them to Rwanda. This is not the sort of situation where we get to pick and choose. If we're genuinely about morality, it should be morality no matter where that arises. So I will leave you tonight, and I think this is a really important point to end on. I worked as a Foreign Office legal advisor, and I was always known in that role as the person who was very much about sticking to the legal provisions of the UN Charter when it provided for, for, for force, when it was, but even then to be thinking about it in a much more holistic and complex way. And I think Libya is the personal example of that. There were many in the legal advisors who I work with who obviously I can't name. Many senior people who disagreed with me. And it was hard, I was a junior legal advisor, but they disagreed with me. They said, no, 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 the, you're not being realistic. You're not thinking about the situation on the ground. You don't care about these people. If you did, you would think differently. The law can't be so rigid, life can't be so rigid. And then last year, I met up with one of my former colleagues. And as we were departing, we were just near Westminster. As we were departing, he said, Yasmin. I said, what? He said, I just want to say to you, and he was smiling. He said, you know what? You were right. Had the West not intervened in the way that it did post-2001, the world would be a very, very different place. And I say to you tonight that I understand and I appreciate the complexity of this situation. But what has been laid bare very, very clearly is that the Western interventions that we have seen to date have not on the whole led to security, stability and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin. We are now going to turn to a round of floor speeches. If we could try and keep these to around two minutes and wait until a microphone has made its way to you. Before you start your speech, please could you give your name and college so we have it for the record. So for a reminder, the debate is this House believes that Western interventionism has been a force for good. Does anyone want to speak in proposition of the motion tonight? Um, so, I think we've all been reflecting on the nature of the world and our geopolitical situation after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It has torn to pieces an international order, has profoundly shaken realities, and I hope has awoken us all out of the rude assumption that conflicts will always remain conflicts in faraway lands about which we know nothing. The issue that stands before us tonight is the rise of isolationism the rise of false prophets who tell us that everything will be fixed if we simply shove the problems of foreign nations out of our mind and out of sight. I do not deny for a moment that there has clearly been Western overreach that has um, compounded this problem, especially in cases of Iraq and Afghanistan, but I think we need to reflect carefully for a moment on the consequences of isolationism. Isolationism allows other powers to forcibly subjugate countries and we assume breezily that it is not our business and not our prerogative because we are simply foreign to us. Isolationism means that the United States does not bring, for example, its full power to bear in protecting Europe. We have a situation in the United States right now where they perhaps stand on the precipice, depending on a presidential choice, of withdrawing from NATO and the Western apparatus entirely. I want to assess why I think the interventionist stance of the United States has been so much better than its isolationist stance of previous decades. Despite all of its flaws and problems, we have an um, extremely powerful power in the sense of the United States safeguarding democracy in Europe, providing, for example, guarantees of security and stability. And I just want to reflect that whilst we hear a lot about the mistakes of intervention, we do not hear from the voices of those who would have suffered without it. We do not hear, for example, from the voices of hundreds of thousands of Kosovars who might have been massacred, forcibly displaced from their homes and torn to pieces by Milosevic, 
the fascist regime if we were to follow the advice and simply wait for Russia to have sanctioned that in 1999. That would have been a horrendous oversight. We hear a lot about Iraq. We do not hear about Syria because it doesn't fit this simple narrative of Western guilt. We do not hear about, for example, the hundreds of thousands who've been killed by Russian and Syrian forces who have far less respect for human rights than anyone in the United States who go around massacring people in hospitals. So I want to ask you all, we have to fundamentally think about how we want to shape our world. If we look at Ukraine, we can see the horrifying consequences of what happens when aggressors are emboldened in the fires and ashes of Mariupol. We can see that. But we can also see glimmers of hope for when intervention is logically thought through and contained, such as the intervention in Ukraine has been with Western weaponry, the profound hope that can offer to people, the liberation from foreign occupation that can carry to people. So I ask you all when you vote not to consider every case of foreign, occupa foreign um, occupation and intervention in the West, but to consider the impact of the United States more broadly on the world, and also to consider the consequences of a world in which we return to a multipolar order of naked aggression, in which we return to the empire building of the 19th century, and really ask yourself, do we want to live in a world of that type of insecurity, and do we want to live in a world where the, where the cries of foreign people are once again relegated into the back of our minds in the pursuit of naked economic interest? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now does anyone want to speak in abstention of the motion? Abstentions, yes. Thanks, uh, Adam uh, Homerton College. So modern war and our capacity to wage it has made conflict increasingly costly at home and difficult to wage. So some might propose a softer alternative, one of sanctions, blockade, and no-fly zones. Tonight, we'll talk about horrid wars, but I would like to warn against the promise of uh, non-violent interventions, because very often there is no such thing. Because the appeal of the peaceful approach results in <clears throat> uh, deadly ends and only brings us closer to conflicts. Starting with sanctions. In Iraq, before the Blair and Bush invasion, already hundreds of thousands had died from hunger and healthcare collapse <clears throat> because of Western sanctions. Hussein ended up, uh, came out out of that, only strengthened. The prototypical example is of World War II where sanctions against aggressors, Italy for invading Ethiopia and Japan for invading China, escalate, only escalated their aggressiveness because those countries cut off from the rest of the world required resources. This is not to say that World War II, the intervention in, world, uh, in the Second World War was a mistake, only that what will often seem like a step um, to avoid peace will only escalate it. Two no-fly zones. This sounds sensible, like what you do around Heathrow to get people flying with drones. But they were intended to protect people. Chemical weapons in, in Syria and um, bombings in Bosnia um, largely came from, from the air. So what happens when we instituted no-fly zones in Libya? The, the proposal? Limited bombings turned into bombing military targets more broadly, toppling Gaddafi and 20,000 deads in the civil war. To Ukraine, when Americans were asked in uh, April by a Reuters poll whether they supported the no-fly zone, 72% of them uh, were in favor. Only 7% of foreign policy analysts were for it. I, of course, support Ukraine, but this could have very easily spiraled into a World War III. So I don't specifically know about um, the situation in Iraq, but I've read a bit about what happened in Libya. One of the problems with no-fly zones is that in and of themselves, they are very rarely enough to prevent violence. Um, when Obama realized that they can, put, they can keep down the planes, but people are still coming to besiege um, uh, Libya's largest cities, um, they had to escalate the conflict. And so, my, my point is that there is very rarely, um, very rarely are no-fly zones the limit. They will generally devolve into, into war. Intervention can be good or bad, but I think we'll, we do better if we don't lie to ourselves. 
A moral mission is worth nothing without competence. And so often we make things worse. There is no such thing as a nonviolent intervention, and I hope this house can remember that. Thank you. And does anyone wish to speak in opposition of the motion? Yes, in the second row. We've spoken a bit about Western interventionism, and it was alluded to acts of empire. And I want to give a couple of examples of acts of empire. For example, if you know your history, France in Algeria, um, British mandate in Palestine in giving away land which wasn't Britain's to give away, um, the partition of India, the withdrawal, need I say more, and in the current day, the failure to intervene sufficiently in Yemen, which is a massive humanitarian crisis of huge proportions, which we are failing to adequately address, which we could simply do by giving aid, yet isn't being addressed, whereas other issues which the West need not intervene in or shouldn't be intervening in are, for example, the fa failure of the West to intervene in Israel despite its massive human rights abuses, yet countries with a lesser amount of human rights abuses are being militarily um, invaded, I think is, is just shocking. No, thank you. And furthermore, the various assassinations of African leaders when they seek to escape their colonial pasts and develop their own independent currencies away from their past colonial masters, which are being enforced currently by their so-called independence um, contracts, whatever you want to call them, which still enforce uh, financial implications on the countries to this day. Um, and we talk a lot about, no thank you, we talk a lot about Ukraine currently as well and this so-called moral mission of the West. I don't think it is moral, I think it's entirely self-serving in most cases, entirely selfish enterprise to fit its own goals, no thank you. Um, in, in the majority of cases, it's just the West serving its own political needs and this moral idea is simply used to back up uh, whatever fits their case. It's not because they think, oh, this is the best thing to do. We are serving up a moral mission. I don't believe that's the case. Um, often when it's spoken about Ukraine, it's, you know, the, these are Ukrainian people. They're European. They're on our, on our door. These are blonde, um, white, bl uh, blue-eyed people. They're Christian people is what news anchors often say. Um, so I, I don't believe this idea that the West mission is a moral one and I think the consequences of military intervention speak for itself and so I urge you all to vote in opposition to the motion. Thank you very much to all our floor speakers. There are some very good POIs and good demonstrations that it's within the speaker's rights to refuse them or take them. We're now going to turn back to our paper speakers. On the proposition we have Dr. James Vitali. James used to study at Christ College and we used to be the president of this society. James, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. President, first may I congratulate both you on your, your lofty elevation, and, uh, your predecessor on her uh, descent back to the level of us mere mortals after a very successful term. Um, I believe you've made my declaration of interest for me, but as a former president, I'm always very interested in what's going on in this place from afar and... Um, the things we do here continue to be very important. Um, Lara said at the start of this debate that she thought this was going to be uphill, but she pointed out that we had a debate on Afghanistan um, a year ago, this, this time a year ago, um, and actually this House voted uh, that we should have stayed the course there. Um, so I'm, I'm more optimistic, um, and I know that the members will listen to our case on the proposition uh, consciously and, and, and carefully. There are two things that everyone in Westminster um, is talking about this week. The first is the census. Um, so new data from the census, the, the 2021 iteration of the census, have sort of been released in drips and drabs. But the stuff that came out this week was about identity. Now, there are loads of really interesting trends that we could look at um, tonight, but not all are particularly relevant to this debate. So I want to draw out two things in particular. One is the remarkable heterogeneity of this country. And the second is the vast expansion in the number of people identifying as British. So America, you've probably heard this before, calls itself the great melting pot. But these trends show that we have just as good a claim to that title. On that point? Yes. Um, there was a technicality which the ONS put out about this census saying that 
the amount of people who identify as British may not be wholly accurate because in the last census, English was put at the top of the England and Wales census, whereas British this time was put at the top of that. So it may have purely been people clicking the first option in the box rather than a pure kind of shift in identity. So I don't want to get drawn on the hard work of the statisticians at the ONS, but um, I would say the increase in the number of British people was hundreds of percent. So um, I think probably the statistical significance is still relevant there. Um, as I was saying, the number of people identifying as British, but black British, Asian British, and so on, all up. And the census is a sort of mirror that's held up to our society. And what we see reflected back is a deeply diverse country. And whatever your politics, it's surely a remarkable thing that our prime minister is Hindu, our home secretary is a Buddhist, and the surnames of the last four chancellors have been Kwarteng, Zahawi, Javid, and Sunak. The second topic of conversation is about the teaching of history. A debate is going on about a non-statutory history curriculum uh, and the need to strike the right balance between giving children a, you know, a cohesive story of our past, but also teaching the very diverse and various stories of all the individual groups that make up modern Britain. There are also questions about how we teach the thorny issues of things like empire. What is our place in the world? Was it all good? Was it all bad? And so forth. Now, I don't want to get down that specific line of inquiry, but I think that these two things what we look like as a country today and what we look like in the past are fundamentally issues that concern who we are as a people. What is our place in the world? And that gets us to the heart of this debate. And I want to focus specifically on this country uh, as representative of the West. What these things tell us is that for better or worse, we are and have always been deeply and irrevocably implicated in the wider world. I would caution you against the claims made on both the political left and both the right, um, that we should or even can retract ourselves from the global stage, either because we are still nefariously practicing a version of imperialism today, or because, as Neville Chamberlain, in the quote was made earlier, uh, said in, in, in 1938 about Czechoslovakia, that we should not bother ourselves with faraway countries of which we know little. Our history, our identity today, is involvement in the world's affairs. That is our inheritance. That is who we are. Now, the question in this debate, of course, is whether that's a good or a bad thing. And Lara has chosen to focus on um, Afghanistan. Um, which I'm replacing um, Camilla Siddiqui at short notice, who would have been far better at talking about the specific instance um, where our involvement in Afghanistan uh, is concerned. But all I would say is that this time last year, as I mentioned, I was on this side of the floor arguing that we should have stayed the course in Afghanistan. And we have seen, tragically, the consequences of not doing so. Women excluded from government, women excluded from schools, women excluded from public places. I'll just make some progress, if that's OK. Um, but I think there is a danger with this debate, and it's sort of coming out already, of repeating a fairly reductive conversation in which one side, one side goes to the litany of good things we have done um, internationally, whilst the other lists the bad things. You know, Ukraine and Kosovo, good. Iraq, bad. World War II, probably good. Suez, probably bad. Um, it happens in debates like religion, too, and, and Peter is a bit of a vet veteran of these things. But the truth is, as Yasmin has um, pointed out, is in historical context, it's always a bit of both, a bit of good, a bit of bad. Yasmin has also had her own effort at kind of framing the debate in, in, in her way. Um, I have a different take. I think, actually, on the narrow wording of this motion, technically, to win this debate, all our side would have to do would be to demonstrate that our international interventions at some point, somewhere, have in one instance been good. But I don't think that's a particularly useful <laughs> exercise. So I'm not going to do that this evening. And if I may, Mr. President, I'm going to take a slightly different tact. And I want to talk briefly about how our past affects the present. Because it seems to me that addressing some of the biggest geopolitical and indeed um, existential issues that are coming down the line for us depends on the UK being proactive. And the greatest obstacle to that proactivity, to helping solve those problems, is a one-dimensional, anachronistic view of our past. In other words, to do the things I imagine all of us think we should do on things like climate change, global poverty, defending democracy, we need to believe that the UK can be, and crucially has been, a force for good in this world. One of my favourite quotes about perspectives on national identity comes from Richard Rorty. He says that national pride is to countries what self-respect is to individuals, a necessary condition for self-improvement. And I think this perfectly encapsulates my views on the subject. 
To do good in this world, to self-improve, yes, but indeed to improve the world which we all inhabit, we must first take pride in the community to which we belong. Uh, I think that one's first. Is there not a danger that we view our own history with rose-tinted glasses if you need that uh, into the world? Why can't we be ashamed of everything we get wrong and improve it in better and better? Absolutely. I, I, I think that's a very good point, and I'm, I'll try and address it in, the, in, in my next passage. Um, all of us British citizens, and this applies to citizens of other countries that members might be from, have a shared historical inheritance. We did not choose it, but it is ours nonetheless. It's rather similar to be being born in a family. It's a complex mixture of good and bad. You like some relatives, maybe not others. It's, some of it's right and some of it's not, and some of it's wrong. But recognising that there is a fundamental capacity for goodness within that family or within that that inheritance is essential if we are indeed to improve and do good in the future. Pride has a lot in common with ownership. I think of all the dodgy, untidy, unclean university rooms and houses I have in inhabited but haven't owned, and I'm sure you will have your own instances. And I took little, little pride in them. Um, but then I think about the pride someone takes in owning you know, their first home, and I'm sure many of you all would like to own a home one day, and you're equally dismayed at the rebellion in Parliament on building new homes and planning. Here, here. Um, ownership inculcates responsibility, the belief that we are responsible for the state and condition of something. Fundamentally, pride in and ownership of our history and our legacy is required before we can make our country, but also the world outside it, better, safer, and prosperous. All the things that I agree with Yasmin that, that are really important. I'm going to make some progress. Pride demands two things from us. First of all, the obvious point, and the point that maybe Joe's alluding to. Pride means recognising the great good we have done in this world, and that might be a narrow view. But we must have the strength of our convictions that when we have stood up for values like religious tolerance, democracy, freedom, security in the world, we have been a force for good. We should never lose the moral compass that we are given by our involvement in Afghanistan. No, thank you. Actually, no, I take that back. Yes, please, sir. <laughs> a short speech, but can have a little bit of time. I, I think that's the best intervention that's been made all evening. Um, my response to you, um, and your very good point of order, is that, a point of information, is that, you know, I think people that take Afghanistan, because that's been the sort of subtext, people in Afghanistan wanted democracy. I actually think it's condescending to say to these people, Maybe you don't really want democracy. Maybe you don't want freedom. That's what we do in the West, but maybe you don't want it. And I think what we did in Afghanistan was fundamentally laudable. Um, but a very good point, nonetheless. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to carry on, if that's all right. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it would have been. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm, <laughs> Peter, you've completely <laughs> flummoxed me. Um, look, so, even, so take those fantastic things in my view. Even if we can produce a more nuanced picture, a more complex historical image of these things, we shouldn't lose that, that grain of truth, that those were fundamentally good values we were standing up for. And let me get on to the second point to, to answer Joe's question. Yes, pride is about recognising the good things we've done. But it enables us to do something else too. It enables us to take ownership of the mistakes and the sins we've committed in the past, to look at the cases where we have not been a force for good, and we've heard many of them this evening, to reflect on them dispassionately and coolly and to take responsibility for them and to assure, and hopefully ensure we don't make those errors again. It also, and this is something that Lara drew out really powerfully, it also helps us to acknowledge the times when we should have acted but failed to. But it is pride. It's pride and self-confidence that makes this sort of self-criticism productive rather than leading us to greater division and, and greater retrenchment from the world. Anxious, insecure countries step back from the wider world, which prevents them from either being a force for good or correcting those past transgressions I mentioned. 
It is self-confident countries, I'm going to keep on going, so I'm probably running out of time here. It's self-confident countries that step forward to be counted in the world. It is self-confident countries like ours that rush to the defence of others that share the same values. And let's not be under any illusions. That is what's going on in Ukraine. That's why we're supporting them robustly. And I thought the gentleman here made a very good intervention, but you know, I, I respectfully disagree. I think the, the pain that is felt in you know, paid packets across this country as people go to spend, uh, you know, pay their energy bills, is a reflection that this isn't just, you know, grandstanding. Um, people are suffering for what we're doing in, in Ukraine here, not to the same degree, um, but they recognise what we're doing there is, is worth it. We should not deceive ourselves into thinking that there's a counterfactual past in which Britain or the West did not involve itself in the rest of the world, and everything was better and purer and less messy and less complicated. And this extends to the present too. A disengaged Britain does not mean a better world. It means a world where China or Russia fills that void, that space that we would leave. We see that happening already in ports and infrastructure projects across the globe. Do we really believe in this house that that is a better situation? Are we really lacking in our strengths and conditions that much? In the future, we need to be proactive in the world to address the causes and effects of climate change, to defend democracy and self-determination, which I hope members will agree is not something that we should be ambivalent about, but that we should defend resolutely everywhere where it is the principle of government, and I'm thinking of Taiwan. But we need to be proactive to solve the migrant crisis too, and in many ways solve our economic problems. Being the country we want to be in the future demands that we take pride in our past, and that we have faith in our capacity, both in the past and in the present, to be a force for good. Ladies and gentlemen, this debate is as much about our future as it is about our past. Our country in the West more generally has touched every corner of this planet, sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. It is my strongly held view that this history brings with it duties and responsibilities to the international community. The precondition of discharging those responsibilities is having pride in who we are and confidence in our capacity to do good in the world. Fortunately, we have ample evidence to justify that confidence in our long and complex and messy history. I hope this House agrees. Thank you very much, James. We're now going to turn to our second speaker for the opposition, Michael Lawson for Lomo. Michael is a first year undergraduate reading HSBS at St. John's College. He won the right to speak through open audition. Michael, the floor is yours. Hello. So it's my first time speaking in the chamber. And this is a topic that's really, really important and close to my heart. And I think the first thing we have to see and notice is that we're not arguing that intervention should never happen, but we're arguing that historically it has been bad and has not been a force for good. We have to analyze examples in order to see whether it has been a force for good or not. And that's mainly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to focus on three points. I'm going to speak about the malicious intent behind Western intervention, the consequences of Western intervention, and its double standards and cherry picking in order to try and convince you that Western intervention has not been a force for good. Firstly, it's malicious intent. You see, Western intervention is always guised as a moral mission and a need to civilize and liberalize the, to free people from grips of genocide, terrorism, and non-democratic regimes, a trend that has existed since 1492 when Christopher Columbus first set sail. The first speaker of the proposition mentioned that there's a defense of liberal democracy, but why should that be the political model of the world? Surely culture is relative. Surely culture is more complex, as the first speaker of the opposition mentioned. Really and truly, there is an ulterior motive to these interventions, and these motives are far-reaching and sometimes justifiable, but they're always surrounded around the realist acquisition of power and wealth. Western intervention essentially acts as a form of neo-imperialism perpetuated by the global hegemon, currently the United States. And this is in order to maintain its control over international relations and is of course backed by the likes of the UK and France desperate to maintain their international relevance. No, thank you. So the Middle East and North Africa, or MENA, is a prime example of the region of the world that has faced Western intervention with ulterior motives. Some argue that this tension between East and West is a religious one, going all the way back to the Crusades, a feud between Christian states and Islamic ones, but really it's a feud of repackaged colonizers desiring to, er to erode Arab and Persian sovereignty all for resources. 
especially during the world wars, control of the Middle Eastern oil fields was vital to the British victory in particular. Prime Minister Macmillan said in 1957, a couple years after the war, that Middle Eastern oil was the biggest prize in the world, a prize to be hunted, to be sought for by any means possible. No, thank you. And when the British were replaced by the Americans, they also followed this exact same philosophy. You see, a correction must be made. For states like the US that are largely energy self-sufficient, Western intervention is not about access to energy, it's about control. 1991, the first Gulf War between Iraq and Kuwait over territory and all disputes, and it saw the West get involved in the horrors that were occurring in Iraq. You see, they set up no-fly zones, which, as somebody did mention, did sort of work, but really and truly, these sanctions not only destabilized and caused horrors in Iraq, but also it was mainly all for the acquisition of resources. 2003, an illegal unilateral invasion to disarm Iraq of alleged nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons of mass destruction. Over half a million deaths later, we find out from intelligence that the intelligence that was given was not mistaken, but was in fact fraudulent. And this was known information. In the Downing Street memo, we found out from Foreign Minister Straw that the case was thin and that Saddam Hussein was not threatening his neighbors and his weapons of mass destruction capacity was less than that of Libya, North Korea, or Iran. Yet the invasion still occurred. All for what? Resources and control. 2011, Libya. Gaddafi announces that he wishes to change Libyan reserves from the dollars. A few weeks later, NATO, the puppet of the US, no thank you, suddenly notices his human rights offenses and decides to intervene. How convenient. The intent is not pure. It is too often driven by a desire to gain something. And the Middle East and North Africa are a perfect example of this. Western intervention has been a force for greed. Go ahead. Yes. I think. Okay. Now, I do recognize what was going on in Libya. Yes, he was about to march, but I don't think it's a, relig a ridiculous pretension. I think it's very much true, and there is some truth to it. And I think sort of just cherry picking what you want to take and what you think to be true is the wrong way to go about this argument. Now, onto the consequences of Western intervention. In theory, Western intervention is a great idea. For most of modern history, due to theft and plundering of resources from the global south, the West has been more economically developed. So logically, it would make more sense for them to extend an altruistic hand to help those who can't translate their money into military wealth or lack enough capital to do so altogether. However, as with most political theories, this doesn't really work as smoothly in practice. Due to the aforementioned malicious intent behind Western intervention, it too frequently translates into negative consequences. Entire regions of the world destabilized, communities torn apart, cultures disrespected, economies destroyed, all for the liberal lie of cultural homogeneity and an insatiable quest for power. Syria, a case familiar with all of us, a civil war turned into a failed state due to the poisoned hand of the West. No, thank you. I'm not, here to say that the, I'm not here to say that the West was the cause of the Syrian civil war and dictated the initial terrors of the Assad regime, but rather what was supposed to be an intervention to help and support the Syrian people against terrorism and despotism turned into a boys club proxy war. Airstrikes and, stru and the structural failures of the UN Security Council have led to the perpetuance of a war and have turned a nation of rich cultural heritage and people into a pile of rubble and debris, fled by over 13 million people and claiming the lives of over 400,000. For almost 18 years, UN peacekeepers have been in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But many seem to be confused about what they're actually there to do, provide peace and not incite terror. 2010. A 14-year-old girl, orphaned by conflict, finds her way to a camp pr protected by UN peacekeepers. But instead of being kept safe, she is raped and left impregnated. Although she reported it, she never got any help from the UN. Of over 2,000 sexual abuse and exploitation complaints made to the UN between 2010 and 17, 700 occurred in Congo. Somalia, 1992. The US led a military operation for humanitarian intervention and peacekeeping efforts in Somalia, which led to the Battle of Mogadishu, in which thousands of Somali fighters and civilians were killed. 
This intervention led to the festering of internal conflicts and failed intervention attempts to catch the likes of IDEED, which has left the country engulfed in clan civil war, destabilizing it and leading it to failed status. The consequences of intervention have often been negative. That is not to say that some have not benefited, benefited from Western aid, but surely if there are millions that can attest to Western intervention causing the failures of their homes, it is almost morally questionable to say that Western intervention has been a force for good. Western intervention has been a force for destruction. Now, on, no thank you. And onto the cherry picking and double standards of Western intervention. Western intervention is malicious in intent, and this leads to negative consequences. The falsehood of Western intervention, the creation of a universalistic standard of human rights and equality, is not only just, a, is not only just anything but universalistic in Western choice of intervention, but also incredibly ironic. The Rwandan genocide of 1994 is one of the greatest examples of the failures of Western intervention, and was even a driver for the UN's creation of responsibility to protect. Over 500,000 Tutsi deaths could have arguably been prevented if the UN acted earlier. Their action was delayed by the US, who were preoccupied destroying Somalia to drive action in aid for Rwanda. Western intervention is extremely selective and driven by factors such as leadership, like Blair with Kosovo, the CNN factor stimulating body bag syndrome, and national self-interest. Western, Western intervention is designed to defend human rights, Okay, so why, despite evidence, has the UN, US, or UK not intervened in China? Xi Jinping is actively imprisoning and infringing on the rights of thousands of Uyghur Muslims, but we hear nothing but silence from the West. The IC... No, thank you. The ICC, another arm of intervention and institutionalism, designed to convict crimes against humanity. The ICC has only ever convicted three people, and guess where they're from? The continent of Africa. Is that to say that Africa has no human rights, or is the breeding ground for dictators, or that Africans are simply driven to violence and barbarism? No, thank you. This is the same West that kills its black and brown people and whose police officers can fix their knees on civilians for eight minutes leading to asphyxia or for the sake of a banknote, or are still beholden to draconian laws. This is the same West that intact entire religions and its people for decisions, all because it doesn't ascribe to their own beliefs. I mean, Guantanamo Bay is still open. When will the ICC put all the many failed Western leaders on trial for their crimes? Surely we must analyze ourselves, no thank you, surely we must analyze ourselves before looking at others. Western intervention has not been a force for good because it's cherry picking and it's double standards. Universal means universal, not non-Western and when convenient. Western intervention has been a force for neo-imperialism. Go ahead. What you describe as convenience, like it's inconvenient for us to invade China, is just acknowledging the international reality that that wouldn't do anybody any good because it would destroy us a whole world of pain. When intervention has been targeted, it's been specific and limited. Um, and those cases are not analogous to cases of, say, just invading China. I'm not necessarily asking... I think that's a very, very good point. Oh. I've a point of information to the gentleman who just made a point of information. Point of order, no. Okay, um, what I wanted to say was that's a very good point. And I'm not arguing that the UK should just invade China, but I'm saying recognize what is going on with um, the Uyghur Muslims in China. And if you want to say that you want to intervene for human rights and you have a universalistic standard, why pick and choose who decides and who has better human rights than someone else? No, thank you. I need to conclude. Sorry. <laughs> Um, to conclude, I think that you need to consider every single case in order to make a comprehensive conclusion. And we're not trying to say that Western intervention should never happen or is that it's just this terrible thing. We're trying to say that Western intervention historically has not been a force for good. And we think that morally is very... No, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> we think that morally it is not a, a convincing argument to say that it has been a force for good. And I hope when you leave today, you vote for side no. I'm opposition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for your first speech. Uh, we are now going to return to another round of floor speeches. Again, these are going to be around two minutes. And please give your name and college before you start. So... Who would like to speak in proposition of the motion? Please raise your hand. 
Uh, thank you. I'm Jeff Lilly from Lucy Cavendish College. And uh, before I begin, just first forgive me. Um, my friends uh, here have, have uh, often given four speeches. I'm far less eloquent in, than them, so forgive me as I say, oh, and um, and ah, and have uh, underdeveloped arguments. Um, but I would just like to make a, f a few points regarding uh, how this debate is taking shape. And first of all, I would just like to address um, those arguing against the proposition. Uh, universal is not in the resolution. Uh, they're sort of recontextualizing debate, uh, demonstrating that uh, the affirmation has to prove that in every single case, Western intervention has been a force for good. It's just writ broadly, and I think that this, um, those arguing against the proposition are guilty of just as much cherry picking as those arguing for it. Uh, Specifically, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about uh, the portions of history that they're selecting. Um, Ms. Ahmed actually even said in her speech that she's not only interested in what happened um, in 2001 and in 2022. The fact of the matter is we can take those 20 years of history into consideration when we consider how Western, Western um, influence has been a positive force for good. Uh, for example, um, look, at, look at an example where, where there has been a continued US president, presence, say, in South Korea. I don't think we would argue that South Yes, sir. Uh, you said that between 2001 and the current left, right. uh, it was a force for good, but that doesn't factor in the economic development um, Afghanistan would have had. Well, again, but, you, but uh, thank you very much for your argument. Uh, no, I, I admire your bravery in, spe in speaking up. You're speaking more eloquently than I am currently, so. Uh, <laughs> No, but of course, we also have to take into consideration the social impact, the fact that the lives of millions of Afghani women actually were tangibly improved, and they are considerably worse now. Uh, the fact of the matter is that many civilians in Afghanistan had better lives in the 20-year uh, 20 period where the United States had a substantial military presence. Um, and, and again, I would also just question, especially with regards to the last speaker, yes? that are in Afghanistan into the UK? Uh, again, this isn't, uh, now I, I would be perfectly willing to have that discussion with you. That's not what the debate is about. It's talking about Western intervention writ broadly. The fact that we have been a for, like, well, I guess well, I'm not, I'm not opposing immigration. I'm just saying that, that it, But it's part of a holistic picture. I, I well, now, now, yes, I agree with you. Uh, yes, Amy. Um, can I just point out that I believe <laughs> 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 Isolationists are just as against immigration and refugees as global interventions are. It's not incumbent on him to defend every yeah. racist opposing Afghan refugees. And I think that's yes, and, and see, this is where, uh, again, just bringing it back, yes, uh, we do have to keep to the resolution. We cannot have a debate about everything in this union. But my, my, my final point is just uh, the selective picking of, of, of arguments with regards to how the West is materially uh, advantaging from occupation of certain countries. I really can't think of uh, major resource sources in, in, say, Somalia and Afghanistan that would, uh, that would provide ex extreme material benefit to, say, the United States. I mean, the United States is estimated to have lost something like $2 trillion in uh, the wars in, in, in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I do have to wrap this up. Uh, so I would just say that, that uh, both sides of the argument, um, if, again, those arguing against the proposition are going to make this case, are both just as guilty of cherry picking. Thank you very much. <laughs> Does anybody wish to speak an abstention of the motion? Hello. Um, I, I actually really agree with the person who just went before me. My name is Raymond from Fitz. But I feel like doesn't that lean towards abstention? As if both sides are cherry picking. I'm finding myself every time somebody speaks, I'm agreeing with them. I'm on their side, but nobody's actually given the whole holistic picture of all the bad things and the good things and then gone, oh, it's been more bad than good. They've just gone, it's been bad. Here's all the bad things. It's been good. Here's all the good things. I mean, I'm just gonna keep changing my mind. That's why I'll get to the last speaker and vote for them. But yeah. And does anyone want to speak in opposition of the motion? Uh, first of all, I, I think there is a false, that there are some assumptions that are informing certain, uh, the views that are coming from both sides. And I find the side I'm speaking for is actually falling into the trap of the logic that is being proposed by the proposition. I think the idea of Western interventionism, this is what I read here on this paper, 
interventionism. The idea that the West, in all circumstances, or even in some circumstances, has an anointed right to intervene, even in genocides, has some problems, especially if you were to imagine a counterfactual, which people were avoiding. What if there is another polity, a center of power that emerges at the end of this century that has enough military capability to police the world, and it is intervening in Europe and in North America. People are already dreading the possibility of China becoming a global economic power. Well, China has ever become a global economic power. Several times, actually, as recently as the 1830s, it, it, it accounted for around 30% of global GDP, but it never invaded any nation during that time. So the idea, the idea that Western interventionism, especially in, for example, late colonialism, in my part of the world, Uganda, a man called Gerard Porto came to intervene and stop slave trade. There was no slave trade in the Great Lakes region. But he came to intervene in, you know, the excuse, the, the, the pretext was, we are going to stop slave trade. There was a more, there's always a moral reason. But we know the intentions were drawn far earlier. The intentions were drawn in Berlin, they had already agreed that Britain would take over the Nile Valley, whether there was any form of human rights abuse or something. So I think the problem with proposing that even in situations where human rights are being abused, that the West should feel the moral obligation to intervene using Western values and Western protocols of interpreting how society should be run. The problem with that, what if we have at a certain point of, in history, and you, you've already created this precedent, that if I am a global hegemon, I have enough power to police the world, I have enough economic and military power, and I have political coalitions that can give me enough ground, that can give me firm ground to intervene in any part of the world, to roam around the world. What if, imagine if other values that are coming, say, from Africa, from China, from Russia, from the Islamic world, which you may not like, which you may think are, thank you, which you may think are not progressive, what if they're imposed on you? What if they realize some of the things you're doing are actually against their values, against what they consider to be universal values, and they intervene? I think the opposition, I wish, could make that point, the point of the other counterfactual. Just concluding, I just think that the logic of intervention, if we factor in the possibility of other countries and other societies intervening elsewhere, if we are not allowing China or Russia to intervene, Russia, by the way, is using the excuse of genocide to intervene in Ukraine. It is using the excuse of genocide. So imagine if another country were to use the same moral claims to intervene in Europe, in England, God forbid. Thank you very much. While we have temporarily lost our final speaker for the opposition, we still have our speaker for the proposition. So we're going to turn now to our final round. Linda Yang. Linda is a second year undergraduate student reading economics at Emmanuel College. She, run, she won the right to speak through open audition. Linda, the floor is yours. Is the mic working? Is it, is it working? Cool, yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. It's my, indeed my honor to speak here tonight. And before I start, I'd like to make the confession that I actually auditioned for the opposition side of the debate tonight and turned out didn't get the spot. Well, my, Mitch, my implied that Michael is a better speaker than I am. So, yeah, so I woke up this morning knowing that I'm going to make a case for the proposition. And I look at the case studies in countries that have been looked at and that I've looked at in the past one week, highlighting the hypocrisies, failures, inconsistencies of Western interventions in these countries, and think to myself how I'm going to make a case for the proposition. <laughs> but yes, 
nevertheless, I'm going to try. So to start us off, I'd like to go back to where Western intervention starts. After the Cold War, a loose consensus grew in Western capitals around the idea of humanitarian interventions. T Tony Blair, speaking in Chicago in 1999, revived the concept of the just war. In a globalized, interconnected world, world he argued, nations should abandon outdated principle of non-interference. Combining self-interest and moral purpose, they had a duty to defend and uphold universal values, including human rights. In the backdrop to the Blair Doctrine was, as, La as Laura has, has mentioned in her speech, was the, co was the, co was the crisis of Kosovo and, and the Rwanda genocide. In both cases, it is commonly believed that millions of lives could have been saved if the West has intervened in some forms. After, after Kosovo, there has been relatively benign internet, international interventions in East Timor and, and Sierra, Sierra Levon, and, and, the, and there are cases of intervention in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, y Yemen, and also, most recently, Ukraine. The failures and successes of these interventions are a mixed, and, and in the speech, I will examine them respectively and argue that, in most cases, Western interventions have been carried out with good intentions and achieved co commendable outcomes, and in cases when undesirable outcomes has occurred, it can be attributed to the failures of implementation and establishment of long-term strategic goals. While, while, the opposite, while, while the opposition has tonight attempted, it can, the case can be made about the ineffectiveness of Western intervention. It cannot challenge the core values and merits of, of the interventions. So the first merit of Western intervention is that it can be used as a potential tool to save lives. Should it justifying the case for humanitarian interventions? Yeah, yes, please. Yeah, I really appreciate that, but uh, I don't know if you've been listening to what I've been saying. It's like Western interventions. There are, there are many cases that the West has intervened in many different countries under uh, under drastically different circumstances. And Iraq has definitely won the case that Western interventions hasn't been turned out to be great. And, and I, 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 total, I fully acknowledge the fact that lives have been, been lost and there are se 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 severe ca casualties and the West could have done a much be better job in the case of Iraq. But also, what, what tonight's debate, as like both the proposition and opposition sides, we're hi highlighting cases of Western interventions, their cases when it, when it has been good and the cases when it hasn't been carrying out that good. So I think the burden of, of our side is to prove that in general, as we, as we weigh all of these cases that West has intervened in these countries, like in general, do the, the West, ha, has the Western intervention bring more good than harm? This is the, the, the burden of proof for the proposition, and I'm trying to do that in, in, in my following speech. Uh, okay, so uh, so also, where, where, where am I? Okay, the, the Australian-led inter intervention, the Australian-led intervention force for, for East Timor in 1999 stopped their civil war and allowed for a transition to a peaceful government. For, similarly, Operation Barras uh, 2000, so British troops haunt Hot, hot violence in, in many countries. And, and Gaddafi's march in Benghazi hasn't been stopped by White House, led by Obama in 2011. It will have the potential to lead to mass killings in Libya. So intervention, when conducted well, when conducted well can and does save lives. In a world of increasing violence, it is ever important to remember that. Uh, no, thank you. So the, the second merit of Western intervention is that it prevents the rise of sphere of influence of other superpowers, like Russia. This is the case for Syria. The, the lack of coherent Western policies on the country left the door open for, for Russia to exercise, to exercise control instead. Russia's interests and values are in many ways opposed, opposed to the West. And, and take also the case of Ukraine. Ukraine and its international support have succeeded in preventing an outright Ru Russian victory, imposing severe and con con continuing, con con continuing costs on, on, on Russia, r r ranging from ranging from high casualties to financial sanctions. Whatever happened, the nation has solidified Ukraine as a, as, as a, as a nation that it's 
that it's independent and Western orientated. And I think that that is uh, what, what we are hoping to see. And lastly, there's the argument for security. If the, if the Clinton government that didn't declare war on, te on terror, that there wouldn't have been more rampant expansion of Islamic extremist groups, such as the ISIS and Al-Qaeda, the extension of such groups not only undermines the stability of states they inhibit, and also threaten the rights of the, the rights of women, children, and minority groups. It also posed security threats to the rest of the world. Yeah. Isn't the ISIS example quite a bad one? Um, people generally agree that ISIS was able to come out of Syria, and in particular Iraq, because of the power of Iraq, um, following the invasion. If you say it, mm. oh, you know, in an invasion, uh, we did an intervention that takes ISIS, um, we had caused ISIS to be there, and a million people plus are dead. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think the case is that uh, there has been con like uh, con like debates around the American war on, on, on terror, and definitely there are cases that have been stats that show that Islamic extremist group has actually uh, increased since the, the war. Terror, but the fact is that we don't really have contrafactual here, so we cannot really decide if the West uh, the, doesn't inter West didn't decide to intervene. What will be the outcome that we're seeing today? But definitely, like given the, no, the given the crisis that the West has faced is, is, was facing back then, I think it's definitely a wise decision for the West to intervene in the in the middle in the mi Middle East. Yeah. Oh no, thank you. And also, my last point. So my, my last point is that Yasmin m m mentioned about, like I say, saying about human rights. And uh, I would like to point out that one consequence of Iraq has been the refusal of politicians and public in the US and the Britain to, to uh, back intervention in, in Syria. In Syria, each day, unnumbered innocents are killed, uh, tortured, raped, as it were before our eyes, yet our eyes are sh sh shut. If we're talking about human rights, aren't these the things that we're, ta aren't these the things that we're supposed to be talking about? Inste instead of arguing against Western intervention, also on a point that I think uh, Michael raised, instead of ar arguing against Western intervention on the ground that the West has consistently ignored or misunderstood the cultural, unique cultural political system of the countries that have intervened in, we should be working on a working on creating a system that has a m meaningful consensus, establish criteria for Western interventions, su such as what we ask ourselves, does such actions have broad domestic international support? What exactly are its aim and what are, are, are they re realistic? Is it legal? Is it morally justified? How do we achieve it? M m m m Literally or through, through, through other means. So what, what the proposition I'm arguing for tonight is not saying that Western intervention historically and also recently has been completely flawless, but what I'm saying is that it has core merits and, and values that we, we shouldn't ditch. And also, uh, Western intervention has been and should continue to be a force that Western, uh, um, no thank you, should continue to be, to be a force for good. And it is not the tool that we should be arguing against, but rather the way that we use this tool, which, which Western intervention in this case indeed has the potential to bring goodness and harmony to the rest of the world. With that in mind, so proud to propose. Well done, Linda. We are now going to turn to our final speaker of the evening, Peter Hitchens. Peter Hitchens is a journalist and author, currently a columnist for the Mail on Sunday. He's been a resident correspondent in Moscow and Washington and has visited 57 countries on assignment from North Korea to the DRC. His latest book, A Revolution Betrayed, is about the destruction of state grammar schools and the resulting effects on the education system. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Do I call you Mr. President yet, or is it? No. Okay. <laughs> I get these things right. I'm trying to remember that point of information I was going to come up with, but it's so good. Uh, I speak uh, this evening as a reformed imperialist. <laughs> I was born an imperialist. I was born in the empire. Uh, I was actually born in the reign of uh, His Majesty King George VI, King Emperor. Uh, my father had been for many years before that uh, a serving officer in the Royal Navy enforcing British hard power from Shanghai to Buenos Aires. Uh, on one occasion, he'd been called back from halfway across the Atlantic to go and put down riots 
in Haifa, in what was then the British Mandate of Palestine. So I also grew up with something of a knowledge of the extent and nature of the British Empire and of what it did and of how the current world came into being. And this seems to me to lie beneath any discussion of this kind. The task of all intelligent people uh, discussing any of, these, any of these matters is surely to penetrate the disguises in which history advances itself. Things are simply not always what they seem or what they are portrayed to be. And I find, as a journalist who has to watch many of these events firsthand and who has seen so many of them, that it's very distressing to see the way in which the modern world is so easily gulled and bemused into believing fantasies about what is going on around us. I'll come, I hope, at some point to the issue of Ukraine, where one of these fantasies is very much in play. But here we have a, a very major problem. All of the crises in which we intervene have long, deep roots. Some of them are even longer than, they, than, than I prepare to, I'm prepared to go back into. But take, for instance, Afghanistan. Uh, two members of my close family uh, were actually involved in the fighting in Afghanistan. And I therefore feel I have a rather strong stake in it. But what we have to realize here uh, is that the crisis in Afghanistan, which we supposedly went in to sort out, was largely the result of the efforts of Spigniew Brzezinski, uh, President, Carter's, uh, President Carter's national security advisor, in creating the Mujahideen forces in Afghanistan to drive the Russians out. The very same Mujahideen forces, which we then found ourselves confronting as our bitterest enemy. Uh, there's an excellent film, both very funny and very intelligent, called Charlie Wilson's War, in which this absurd uh, process is actually described in some detail, and it is very educational for anybody who can really, really wishes to stand up and say that the, the, the West intervened in Afghanistan for moral reasons. Our policy in Afghanistan is catastrophic, has been for many years, because it is one of those places where, during the Cold War in particular, uh, the superpowers competed for influence. Where my uh, relatives were fighting in Helmand, there were American canals uh, built in the year 1949 as uh, one part of intervention, uh, not, until not very long ago in Kabul, uh, now a, a, a place of, of, of veils and burqas and grim Taliban censure, uh, women wore the same sort of clothes that they wore in the West and lived lives very similar to those in the West before these interventions got going. I have personal experience of, of uh, a couple of interventions. Uh, one, I was present in Mogadishu in the, the night when the US Marines arrived and George Bush Sr.'s attempt to sort out that disastrous country, one of many. Uh, what I learned there was, again, that this had at one time an extremely prosperous and settled country. It now has a huge diaspora of highly intelligent and educated people who can't live there anymore because of the disastrous interventions by East and West to try and take control of it and has sunk uh, from the level of, a, of a, as I say, a highly civilized city in Mogadishu uh, to a very, very dangerous slum. I saw that. Uh, it was also in Baghdad uh, in the months after the Blair Bush intervention. And again, what you saw in Baghdad was catastrophe, the higher catastrophe imposed on, 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 a, on a country already in severe difficulties thanks to idiotic Western sanctions, uh, the, the, resulting in, in greater and greater chaos. The ridiculous, the, uh, yes indeed. Um, can, uh, I'll try and speak up, hopefully you can hear me. That, I can so far. On that point of idiocy, and noting also Yasmin's point of um, policy framing not surviving contact with reality, do you not find that the term Western intervention discussed in this debate is so inherently unstable, so normalizing, and so contested that ultimately we'll be unable to come to any meaningful conclusion whatsoever? Well, no, on the contrary, actually. I think that if we, just, if we discuss it properly, we will be able to come to the meaningful conclusion of, of, of voting the motion down. And the first Western intervention I can think of in the, the 20th century is the intervention by the Imperial Germany in Russia, uh, in which they financed with tons of gold and uh, enormous amounts of other help uh, the coup d'etat by Vladimir Lenin, which destroyed the only democracy Russia has ever had and reduced that country uh, for 70 years to tyranny, poverty, misery, and secret police. Uh, that was the first Western intervention I can think of. Another one which comes to mind very much is the, is the Western intervention conducted by this country in the United States in Iran in 1953, and the overthrow of the legitimate leader of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh, a, an action which still has bitter and dangerous consequences for the whole world. Our intervention in Iraq, of course, follows the, the British takeover of Iraq as a, as a post 
World War I mandate in the 1920s and their misgovernment of it, our misgovernment of it during that time. These things go back and back and back. That is what intervention is. And we occasionally hear, and we're bound to hear this evening about Rwanda, that horrible massacre which everybody says we should have intervened to stop. Well, if we are so concerned in the Western world about such horrors, why didn't we intervene to stop it? Is it perhaps because the purpose of intervention by the West is not to stop massacres. The purpose of intervention in the West has some other reason, some other purpose, some other aim, which has nothing to do with, with humanitarian intervention. Take another example, which I think has to be examined here. I will try to, there are so many of these, I'll try to be brief. There was some time ago an event called the Arab Spring, in which it was believed by many people in the West that we were about to see a birth of democracy and freedom in the Arab countries. Well, here's the thing. Uh, when democracy and freedom arrived in Egypt, uh, as, I, as I witnessed, the, the, the main beneficiary body was the Muslim Brotherhood, a group of people who were not approved of at all in the West. They did not desire to see Egypt ruled by the Muslim Brotherhood. So, good heavens, what happened? Uh, the, the Egyptian army intervened and removed the Muslim Brotherhood very undemocratically and brutally uh, from office and massacred people in the streets of Cairo on an absolutely astonishing scale, barely reported in this country, so as to frustrate the very democracy we had claimed to be in favor of. What is this rubbish? I mean, what is this rubbish? We simply do not have a clue what we are doing if what we are doing is what we say we are doing. If you have a genuine and, 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 and heartfelt and decent animus against the mistreatment of people in faraway countries of which you may know something or nothing, I don't care. If you have that, then you must consistently apply it. If you do not consistently apply that outrage, if you do not act to, 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 to stand against it and prevent it where it happens, then it is not a reason for your action, it is a pretext. Yes, indeed. You say, you mentioned the Arab Spring, you mentioned that we should always do this, always intervene no matter what, but a lot of things happen, logistics, money, uh, support. But I ask you this, would you have said that the US and the Western countries should have done nothing when Gaddafi's murderous troops and tanks rolled on Benghazi ready to slaughter an independence movement? I, would, I, I, don't, I don't need to argue whether we should do nothing. You need to argue whether we should do something. That we are not in a, we're, we're not in a... I'm not in a position personally to do something, I, although I, as I have pointed out, and I, I stress it because it's important, close members of my family have been in harm's way on these episodes. So I do have a stake in this. I'm not in a position to say to them, go and risk your lives, go and risk having your limbs blown off and your, and, and your intestines strewn over the ground for some idealist standing in a balcony in Cambridge. I haven't got that right. It doesn't exist. If you really seriously want to send people on these expeditions, I su 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 suggest strongly that you need a more consistent, well-worked-out, historically informed, and frankly decent belief in what it is that you want to do. Now, again, if we actually had managed to achieve the, 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 the modern liberal democracy which we claim to want in Afghanistan, and it elected a Taliban government, which immediately voted to, to uh, impose the burqa and all kinds of other Islamic st strictures on that country, what would we do? Would we say, congratulations on your democracy, you get on with doing that? Or would we say, no, actually, you can't do that and intervene again? Is this consistent? Of course it's not. It has no consistency. That is why I say it's a pretext. Now, an awful lot, I have to finish with this because it's a point which I, I, I almost alone make in this country, and it's, it's so vital that people at least hear it made in a country which has almost entirely ceased to, to debate anything adversarially in the past few months. In Ukraine, we are told that what we see is a brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine, and indeed we do see a brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine. No question of that, uh, one which is indescribably filthy and, and, uh, and, and which nobody can defend. But did that invasion simply come out of nowhere? Well, no, it didn't. The whole point about that, 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 that invasion was that it was the result of many, many years, going back at least to 2008, of systematic goading of Russia by the Western powers. The expansion, the expansion of NATO, a policy, this is an amazing thing, a policy simultaneously decried by Henry Kissinger and Noam Chomsky. The only thing, as far as I know, which has ever united those two gentlemen in history <laughs> is that they both think that NATO expansion into Eastern Europe was stupid. Even Robert Kagan, uh, probably the most aggressive hawk on the Russian issue in Washington, has written in Foreign Affairs that the Russian 
invasion was provoked. Why was it provoked? Well, it's an interesting question, and we haven't got time to discuss it. It's another debate. But the point is, the roots of what happened in February this year lie much further back in other things. And where we convince ourselves that what we are doing is making humanitarian invasions, we are often buying stories sold to us by politicians who have other things in mind. And that, as I say, is why we tend not to intervene in so many places where if our policy truly were humanitarian intervention, we would intervene, and why we also intervene in several places where it obviously isn't humanitarian. I offer you this because it seems to me to be vital that we understand that in many cases what we are being asked to do is to approve of ourselves. We're not actually being asked to do good. We're being asked to feel good about ourselves because we can say, oh, look, we intervened. Look, it isn't as easy to get an army or a state into a country as it is to get a television crew into one. In fact, it's three million times more difficult. And when you get there, you have to stay. And for how long are you prepared to stay? And whose brothers, sisters, sons and husbands and fathers are you prepared to send there for how long to die in how many numbers so that it can be done? If you genuinely believe all that stuff, then that's fine by me. If you're gulled by propaganda, then I'm sorry for you, and I really do think that if you come to an institution like Cambridge University, you ought to know better. But whatever the truth is, an enormous amount of supposed humanitarian, benevolent intervention in the world today is dressed up as that, when it is in fact something else. And that is why I very much urge you, I have finished, I very much urge you to oppose the motion. Thank you so much. Before we vote, I just want to say a few things. The first is thank you to everyone for coming tonight. Thank you for engaging in this debate. There are some elements which I probably would have rather have done without. But thank you for everyone in the room for doing this on good terms. And hopefully, we will come away with something to think about. As always, we vote with our feet, our feet and through the doors. Eyes, abstains, and no's. I'll announce the results in the bar. And my team and I will see you next term. And that's all tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs>